Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the latest, the greatest edition of Nick's Nonfiction. You're here with your host, Nick Munez, this time around, proudly presenting Clyde Prestowitz's Japanu Restowed. This just in, two vandals attacked Japan's origami museum. The story is still unfolding. You know, the Japanese did get a few things right. They have this term called karoshi. It translates to overworked to death. America, since 1940, I would say, has become karoshima. <laughs> People are dropping left and right at their third and fourth jobs. Old slantai overseas think they're slick. They invent sudoku. Well, America invented sapuku. Who would you choose to hold the sword while you jump on it? I would choose my boss. Clyde Prestowitz is a Jewish magician. Clyde Prestowitz, oh, I'm going to make this coin disappear and reappear into my wallet. You see this Clydesdale? Now you don't. Presto. Clyde Prestowitz, the man spent decades in Japan as a foreign advisor. He's got a well-rounded take on everything from culture to the infrastructure of wooden cities. Why would you build your city out of wood? I'm a fellow neckbeard talking about Japan today. I'm a cultural expert. I've spent over a thousand hours watching anime. Maybe my Horima body pillow will be able to get a dual residency, my lady. Japanese culture, they don't give a fuck what anybody thinks. You could go over there, buy some used underwear and a vending machine. Sounds a little bit more American than we are at the moment. Doing a classic Eastern versus Western battle of ideologies today talking the caffeine wars. And speaking of calves, we're gonna learn about the best beef on the planet, Wagyu. Call me Jiro, I dream of Coochie. <laughs> Everyone who goes to Japan experiences culture shock. Anthony Bourdain, the guy who's seen the whole world, that's his favorite destination. Could you really assimilate to wooden beds, you know, shitting in an open hole, cooking dinner on a Bunsen burner? You'd think everything made out of lumber there they would use microwaves, right? <laughs> Not nah, open flames. There's some residual feelings about radiation over in Japan. <laughs> Crowd loved that one. There's ill will between my homeland and Japan. Do I feel remorse? Eh, how about you think twice next time you kamikaze Pearl Harbor? Even though all of our carriers were conveniently out of port that day, is still warranted two thermonuclear bombs on civilian cities. It's a pretty pogger move by America. I don't feel bad. I thought nuclear fallout has a half-life of 200 years. How did people move into Hiroshima five years later? I don't know. There might be some bigger questions sprinkled throughout the show today. You know what I used to tell my boss at the sushi restaurant? I need a toke, yo. That's how I get a smoke break. What would George Washington say if you told him that in 2017, it's now possible to eat breakfast in Tokyo, lunch in Paris, and dinner in Chicago? George would say, the fuck is Chicago? That one doesn't deserve a laugh track. Lots of questions, lots to learn today. Pour up some sake, say kumpai, and enjoy our latest edition after a word from our sponsors. <laughs> Sour. Clara, tell me what you see. Hmm. Beef and broccoli. Two guys who look completely different. Seven. Now take a look at this. <gasps> Watch out! Turn it off signaling! Hit the brakes suddenly! Drive in the wrong lane! <gasps> Still think being Asian is cool? About the author Clyde Prestowitz. Uh, go check out Instagram, Harry Schwant, and Patreon.com slash The Niche. Getting real hot this time of year. Uh, free hikes, you know, the memes are at an all-time silliness. And big books for our top secret editions. What do cannibals eat in Japan? Raw men. Clyde Prestowitz is the founder and president of the Economic Strategy Institute. He's formerly served as the counsel to Secretary of Commerce, the Reagan administration he was on, and has written for Foreign Affairs. He did his undergrad at Swarthmore, more like Waspmore. 
And he got his MBA at Wharton. There's not much about this guy online. Japan Restored is his only bestseller. He's been on CNN in 2013. He had a piece come out called, Could Germany Save Eurozone by Leaving It? There was a Brexit. There could be a Germzit or a Deutschzit. This guy's a political animal. He's been in the White House and the Reagan administration. Japan is where East meets West. We should be able to glean some cultural knowledge off of this book. Wisdom. My tryout for the 2020 diving team was a flop. I made quite a splash with the judges. Boo! What do you call a homeless guy in Japan? Tokyo Drifter. (laughs) That's good racist humor. The laugh track got me going. Here's another racially insensitive advertisement. <laughs> this is my home. Okay, mine too. Why are you taking pictures Where of me? Where do you live? I live in Scottsdale. Why are you taking pictures of me? Michigan plates? Yeah. Why are you taking pictures of me? Well, you know what? We've had problems here. I don't care. You don't know me. Why are you taking pictures of me? And I don't know you. Do you know a lot of white men are doing racist things in this world, sir? No. You don't know that? You're not aware I'm of that? I'm a racist. You are a racist. I'm a racist. Okay, that's fine. Okay. So, so what's, what's your issue? point? Why are you here? Who is ready for a show, ladies and gentlemen? Chapter 1, Clyde Prestowitz's Japan Restored Tokyo 50-50-2050. How do you mess that up? Clyde starts by giving us the experience of a 2050 diplomat visiting Japan. Quote, it's spring 2050 and you're embarking on a business trip to Tokyo. You board your all Nippon airline flight in D.C. And after a ride of about two hours on a Mitsubishi 808 supersonic jet, you circle Haneda Airport in preparation for landing. I'd bet billionaires already have supersonic jets. Mitsubishi could barely make a good automobile there. 25 years, they're going to be killing it. Clyde estimated that in the 2050s, Boeing will acquire Mitsubishi. (laughs) They're going to make advanced carbon nanofibers. So America, Boeing, who advertises on our news, is going to own Mitsubishi. Clyde says your smart luggage will be able to recognize you at the turnstile. That only works if the bozos at Reagan Airport sent your eye suitcase to the right city. Continues for a few pages about smart transportation, and that won't need drivers. It's all owned by Boeing. Can we check, just to start the book, if this guy owns Boeing stock? That would be a shame. It's good to hear that by 2050, Japan will have another 15% of the workforce unemployed, thanks to self-driving cars. Kuroshi. To be honest, I think the future is going to look at us as barbarians because we hurtle down the freeway with drunks swerving in and out of lanes. He's being dramatic. We're not barbarians. I have an electric car. You ever see that video of an orangutan driving a golf cart? One-handed, he's doing K-turns. It's badass. (laughs) A monkey can drive. Prestowitz is saying that, uh, yeah, we're going to be smart because we're going to teach computers how to do it. Prestowitz adds his infrastructural knowledge. Since Japan lagged behind modern cities in the 1970s, they were able to implement newer earthquake-proof designs than most cities. And it's pretty an interesting way to write. Like, he's from the future. (laughs) He's going, in 2050, Japan will never fall victim to an earthquake. He's challenging an act of God. Quote, Even more important is Japan's development in carbon fiber-based ultra rope. I've been reading these future tech books. The military is investing heavily in fabric research and development. They love their fibers. Remember the second Spider-Man franchise, Andrew Garfield? He hates Mondays. (laughs) The webs in his shooters were developed by Oscorp. To be strong enough to pull an airplane. I don't know why that's so important. I see in the sky by me, they're always tugging gliders. That's got to be some strong rope. He's talking like he's from the future again. Japan now has buildings taller than the Burj Khalif. <laughs> okay. It's 2022, Mr. Pretz. So it's Earth to Clyde. 
come in. This is a very telling quote we got here mid-chapter. Greater urban density forested a smart city environment that simulated entrepreneurial activity, which in turn led to faster innovation. What the heck? So he's already trying to confuse you off the bat. Forested a smart city. <laughs> there are forests and there are cities, Clyde. And then he goes to say, we can stimulate entrepreneurial activity and innovate faster by watching what you do. So city planners, they need to be collecting your data and they can do that faster the closer you are to other humans by tracing apps. By this point of the book, <laughs> I'm thinking I'm getting fucking Klaus Schwab, Agenda 2030 here, you feel me? What, what you're saying forested as a, nobody uses that kind of language. He goes on to, to Orwellian. He's blowing the robot concierge at the hotel that you're going to go to. This concierge knows everything. <laughs> TripAdvisor is supposed to be that good right now. And when you listen to that website, you wind up being herded to a landmark with a million other tourists. Is that what traveling is about? There was that uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm bit this year. If you can't trust the concierge... Who can you trust? <laughs> you know, it's hospitality, the most human thing in the world. That's going to be digitized. Awesome. So there's not going to be anybody to complain to at 3 a.m. This guy is pushing so hard. He's making me think that fucking the entire country of Japan is a psyop. It's one giant military base after World War II. <laughs> Another thousand year tradition in Japan. Tea drinking. That's being astroturfed by Starbucks. Their culture is being smart cityed. And I worked at that franchise for a while, had people that visited, did like conferences over there. Dude, <laughs> it's an invasion. <laughs> I said this in another show. It might piss off some Inuits, but it's true. Cities are the new reservations. Free range farm. Go get addicted to promiscuity and alcohol. For our fun listeners, because I got to caveat that statement because that made me sound lame. Go check out Zoo's latest set. It's in Haruku, Japan. It's the firest EDM for an hour. It's free on YouTube. Zoo, Z-H-U. Shout out to the USC boys. Deeper than Clyde just blowing Boeing here this whole chapter. I have a positive spin of my own. We are the most sober generation. See, it's not that cool, but you do deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Every boomer you know is like a wino or a whiskey junkie. Fact. For kids, it's not that cool to get inebriated today. Oh, they're smarter, blah, blah, blah. Most of them are using technology to get addicted. You know, they're getting addicted to social media. I would much rather be getting drunk with my boys. The most sober gay. We'll get into less drunk driving accidents. Well, that's not going to matter. Because you're not allowed to drive in smart cities anyway. <laughs> I don't know. It's the tr monkey's trick right now. Technology is the new opium. Oh, I, we already had 10 years of it. Let me just be honest. I was like part of the generation where I got my first iPhone when I was 16. I've had it now for almost 10 years. I don't need it anymore. <laughs> you know, like I've experienced the novelty and it's worn off. I just want to go back to clubbing and experiencing other humans. But everybody's loving this technology. So Clyde's estimations are probably right. What I do wonder is how come this guy isn't talking about the slew of on-demand porn that there will be at this hotel. The on-demand sex robots that the robot concierge will link you into. No, that's actually going to happen. That's not even a theory. You could rent out. <laughs> you get it. He went on to claim Tokyo will be a beacon for health. Eugenicists will flock from all over the world. That's a very comforting statement, <laughs> given the Holocaust and everything. You see some of the most obese people in American city centers. And this guy's claim is that city centers will now be the place for health. Why? Can you give me some evidence, Clyde? Here's a fun fact. In the 1940s, the Ripley Fat Man, he was a <laughs> 300 pounds. Let me say it again. Ripley's Fat Man, 1943 hundo. 
three hundo doesn't even get you on the TLC channel. You gotta be double that. <laughs> Here's some more dirt. We're supposed to believe child sex trafficking was cured when Jolene Maxwell, you know, went to jail. I think it's still going on. If you look at Belgium, they have this Epstein guy named Dutro. He recently got busted, and 350,000 Belgians showed up to the capital wearing all white. They were going, we want the people who were at Dutro's sex island to get in trouble as well. And I debriefed the book here, James Patterson closed the case. So Americans, you can stay inside and eat chips. Even worse... Nobody talks about Epstein's ranch. This is another level deep. This should be Patreon talk. Most of his investments were into gene editing at the ranch. And his experiments didn't go down on the island. That's what you get taught about. <laughs> you know he bought that ranch with lottery winnings? Because that's fair. This past year, three and a half billion people are like opted into fucking mass gene editing this is the century of biology. That's what all these futuristic Clyde motherfuckers are talking about. So just be weary. Talking about Japan, they have a positive birth rate of 2.3 children. In America, we're the first generation to have less kids, have less money. And even Bill Gates is over there buying up soy fields. That's reason for concern. What sealed the deal on Clyde being a huckster for me, even by chapter one, was this quote. The imposition of a steep carbon tax will offset the impact of pollution and encourage alternative energy. Want to maybe show us the model? You know, he's saying, that'll just be enough of an incentive. We already have the carbon tax. China just prints money to pay for their carbon taxes. You know what I'm saying? All the money is... <laughs> make believe at that high of a level so these people could really just pollute as much as they want and pay it off the bigger point here is we already have the clean energy solution nuclear japan is too afraid because uh fukushima in america we don't use nuclear because it's impossible to meter that small amounts of electricity that's my theory ask yourself why we're still buying light bulbs <laughs> these are just taxes tolls of life like there is a man that invented a car that runs on water he was killed there is you've seen a uh, back to the future we could probably make cars that run on trash but then trash would be valuable and that would destroy the system there is the fda pays farmers to burn excess crop yields so that bread prices stay the same <laughs> Like, go watch that movie in time. We're talking about dystopias today. These are all the tolls of life, and these motherfuckers hide it in light bulbs and things that we have progressed past. They act like progressives. So Klaus, I mean Clyde, is going to keep up with his Orwellian doublespeak here. It's going to be a hard book to stay along with. Take your fucking smart city and shove it up your ass, my dude. Let's dig through this heap for some Japanese culture. Chapter 2, Women to the Rescue. <laughs> I'll entertain his plot for a little bit longer. It's quite obvious the angle he's going to shove down our throat here. If Japanese women... <laughs> I don't know. I don't need to make a joke. I just want to wear a kimono, right? Those things are awesome. Dudes, we're wearing cotton Hanes underwear chafing our sacks. Let's get some silk on the scrotum kimonos are cultural appropriate shut the fuck up listen to Clyde's pandering here in the evening when sidewalks are crowded with workers leaving their offices you notice that there are as many women in smart business suits as men what is a smart suit it advertises your corporation on the back the fucking collar shocks you if you're on break too long so women are gonna look even more butch in the future nice <laughs> <laughs> I was acting. Great. Fucking square-looking women. What kind of world do we live in where you can't even tell a gender of your coworkers or your barber? He continues this shitbag quote. You attend a conference with a Japanese client yesterday. The CEO was a female, and you were <laughs> and you were surprised to see that a majority of people around the conference table were women. 
I'm clearly not the target audience for this book. You hear that, guys? Isn't it so exciting? Men are totally going to cease to exist. Does this sound practical to you guys, listeners? In 30 years, men are going to be the minority at the business table. What the fuck? Clyde is tripping off of his soy diet. He's running estrogen in his brain. (laughs) He said, in 1970, only 200,000 women in Japan had jobs. By 2005, it was in the millions. This doesn't mean men are leaving the workforce. It means both parents have to work for the same amount of money. Like, are we supposed to be happy about... 1970 to 2005 the price per capita of household did not go up where is the wealth going the third wave feminists are like pulling the wool over your eyes go back to the second wave Clyde is straight out saying it's empowering it's feminist to neglect your child and your motherly tendencies quote to maintain its economic growth and standards of living Japan badly needs more of its women to both join the workforce and have more children. Is the point clear? (laughs) Have more kids and work for less. Like, he's fucking draping it a wolf in sheep's clothing as women's empowerment. Women, I'm not making fun of you. You gotta watch out for these fucking snakes. What was this quote? He keeps on bullshitting. Goldman Sachs estimates Japan's GDP would be 15% larger if women participated in the labor force. So good now, Goldman Sachs is in on this fucking rub. I'd love to see the Japanese president stick it to Goldman. What kind of subservience does he have to them? Only 15% improvement? We don't need it. Go away, Goldman Sachs. You know, for every woman to have to work for 15%. Wait, wait, wait. That is a sexist st- sexist statistic. If women are equal to men, they should add 50%. Oh, now I'm sexist. Why doesn't Clyde elaborate on the Goldman Sachs study? <laughs> you know, what else goes up with that 15%? depression suicide yeah Clyde and his fucking it's all hidden in terms of GDP that's what I'm trying to say with the wealth per capita inflation keeps earnings at the same (laughs) bro the government will get richer while couples slave harder but that's okay because women are saving the planet fucking globo homo new world order I'm on board you ready for this Nick's nonfiction claim I would rather Work on a plantation than in an Amazon factory. (laughs) The interview process, has anybody tried it? You feel like you're being brainwashed by Mugatu. What the hell? If I'm on the plantation, I'm in the sun singing Jody's. I'd rather be whipped (laughs) than know my shelter can be taken away. Be destitute. I jest, kind of. Okay, I'm serious. Clyde said the biggest complaint of working women in Japan was insufficient child care. So Goldman and the Japanese government are encouraging women to work without providing the necessary child care that is the biggest complaint of Japanese women. And this doesn't sound like women to the rescue to me. (laughs) Kind of sounds like women need to be rescued by this propaganda. Denying your fertility makes you a boss-ass bitch. Sure. Getting towards the end of the mid-chapter here. Prestowitz is talking about abortion. For my next trick, I will switch places with the baby in your womb. <laughs> Let me call my accountant, Al. Al Kazam. <laughs> Jewish magicians. About 200,000 abortions a year are performed in Japan. That makes no sense because they have one of the longest waiting periods for adoption. <laughs> So they're killing two fetuses with one stone there. On my fellow neckbeards, we could have so many more waifus if you were (laughs) pro-life. I'm not saying that we should ban abortion. Clyde was saying people are just going to go to Thailand. I thought that was one of his really good points. Laws do nothing, Clyde, so why do you keep pushing them? I'm saying 
women can rescue each other. We got all these fucking mommy Facebook groups now. We could find these children home. <laughs> or we could pay abortion doctors. I think it was funny. Clyde said, The Japanese government provides free schooling only from three to six years old. Only from three to six, it's free. They have this weird, like, charter system over there. And for our psychologists out there, those are literally the formative years of a child. They're all cried out, and their mind is a sponge. Okay, now we'll indoctrinate your kids. No charge. Those infant years, yeah, that's on you. But three to six, let us imprint those kids. Can we not? <laughs> Clyde said, you know, like in Germany, they start school at six or seven. Clyde said women who work and enroll their toddlers in daycare get a 10% pension raise. It made me sad. Women who work and enroll their toddlers in this program get a 10% bribe. That's a bribe if I've ever heard one. According to Goldman, it should be a 15% raise, right? Because now they're part of the workforce. But no, outright they're just skimming 5% off the top of your pension. <laughs> like, just pointing stuff out here. China is one step ahead here. They just tell their people, if you don't give us your kids to brainwash, you get minus 500 social credit. You can't fly. You can't use public transportation if you don't comply. So you see how money is the current form of social credit? That's why it's called currency. Yeah, bro. This is all social control. Women will literally give up their kids for 50,000 won or fake internet points in China. What the fuck? Been saying for the past two years that we are becoming China. <laughs> you will comply through social credit or through social engineering. It's two of the same. Clyde is blowing his own spot at the end of the chapter, so that made my day. Quote, public policy will aim at making it easier and more attractive for women to work. Ladies, you're going to look stunning in Gucci's new smart suit. This includes creating role models for women by having corporations hire women as lifelong employees and appointing more women to their boards. What did MLK say? Character doesn't matter. It's all about the sexual organs that you're born with. <laughs> Women come up to the front of the line. That's equality. <laughs> I was acting. You guys fucking get it. I'm brimming with sarcasm right now. What the fuck? Zoomers are lazy. They're brainwashed by TikTok and they eat this shit up. It doesn't matter how hard you work. <laughs> the best man for the job is racist. That's a thing of the past. We have entered cultural Maoism. Welcome to the 21st century. All right, let's go to chapter three. <laughs> Japan speaking English. The name of the chapter tells you his thesis and it supports what I said before. Japan is just an American military base. <laughs> it's a satellite nation. And it'll probably be a forward operating base in the many wars with China to come. By or 2050, Clyde says that much more Japanese heritage will turn to American. <laughs> what the fuck? How is that not racist when he says it? Like if I just go, I want to make those people only like white things. I'm an alt writer. Their language, the cone system, all of that. We're going to whitewash it. Like I read the fucking Alan Watts book. These people are deeper than us. They have honor. <laughs> We're going to go over there and steal all the glory. Short chapter here. It's all predictive models. So it made me think of that economic hitman quote. He says, I laughed myself to sleep thinking of all the professors who thought they could predict the economic models of the world. At one Stroke of a pen, a politician can destroy every predictive model. And then we have algorithms based off of those predictive models. I don't know how much you should be trusting all these things. <laughs> the hyperbole that uh, Clydesdale used for the chapter was, in your Japanese hotel, you turn on CNN or BBC, and there will, no be, there will not be, no be Japanese, a subtitle of Erebu. So even in their own country, by 2050, <laughs> there will be no Japanese on television. 
I'm laughing just because, again, ask yourself, does this sound practical? I guess, like, his target audience is Americans with this book. <laughs> yeah, if Japanese people read this, they'd be like, fuck no, let's start fortifying. Uh, yeah, he's targeting Americans because we don't have to learn Japanese. This sounds great. I never have to learn a new language. <laughs> if Americans... I don't know, man. This is why our military roams free over the world and why we're placated so well. So, yeah, <laughs> it's progressive that we're going to imperialize Japan. Their language is not going to exist in 25 years. What the hell? We destroy their country and call it progressive. And I still can't wear a damn kimono. Big thing he let slip here mid-chapter was Singapore is by for the economic center of the economic eastern world. Singapore. And we're kind of too scared to get our feet wet in China at the moment. Like, we won't support Taiwan. And so the U.S. desperately needs to play Tokyo up to be the center of the eastern world so that we have more control in that atmosphere. The U.S., I'm saying we're too pussy. We're just going to surround them and build islands around China. Let's fucking support their movements, their people. Very academic. Prestowit called this process. I'm not even kidding. Whatever you're doing right now, if you're fucking typing, just stop for a moment and listen. Prestowitz called this process Englishization. So it's not imperialism or eradicating another culture's language. It's Englishization. <laughs> I think when the Spaniards came over and took Mexico in the 1700s, they called it Spanish or Vanish. You see, it's not imperialism. It's not. It's just Englishization. What the fuck, people? They use Orwellian language on us. And just because we're born with the new set of verbs, I'm going to get too meta. Cherry picked a few corporations here. He said, Mickey Tani demanded top-down that their workers speak English. So like we read in The Great Reset, the reset comes through the corporations. Your job has to mandate <laughs> your bodily autonomy. Your job has to mandate what language you speak. And so Mikitani over in Japan is already making them speak English. Clyde's been wrong a few times. <laughs> I'm thinking that Amazon is going to make me learn Mandarin. <laughs> You know, maybe they're winning. We've tried this with the metric system. America doesn't like learning new shit. Even in chop shops, it would be a lot easier. You can't mandate culture through a corporate model. It won't stick. If you're a corporation and you use a gay pride flag, just to refute myself a little bit, seriously, does this sound plausible that in 30 years no one will speak Japanese? used another false dichotomy here at the end of the chapter. Saudi Arabia speaks more English the more business they do. Right, <laughs> because they make their money off of blood oil. The That's the only people they can talk to is what I'm saying. The farmers still speak Farsi. You go to Japan in 30 years, the entire countryside is going to speak Japanese. I'll put money on it, Clyde Prestowitz. His predictive model was called the ease of doing business score. So we have to take it seriously. <laughs> no joke. In the book, it was a Y equals MX plus B curve. The most basic fucking algebra. And he's going, according to this line, Japan will do better business with English. If they speak our language, you get the point. No fucking shit. In fucking uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, they said that Nobody pays attention to the economic models. Like, nobody even reads the articles, and they can't even perceive what the models are supposed to mean. That was an NSA agent for source. Al Gore said that Florida would be underwater by fucking 10 years ago. He said Kilimanjaro would cease to exist. They're all still there. In 20, That's just to let you know, predictive models are often wrong. In 2016, Japan ran the TOEFL test, test of enlist a foreign language. The administrator said Japan's English level was inadequate to meet the country's future needs. They need more women learning English. 
Like, this chapter is dip- disproven <laughs> now. He just said they're behind schedule. So now fix your predictive model. It's not 2050. Yeah, maybe in 2100, the NWO makes everybody speak English. You got a long way to go. That's very ambitious of you, fucking Clyde Klaus. Here's an idea. <laughs> Why doesn't Clyde recommend young Americans go teach English in Tokyo? Right? That makes so much sense. So why don't we subsidize that? Because, Nick, computers are already teaching language. Everybody's getting so much progress done with Rosetta Stone online. No, we can't have the peons connecting with one another. Keep the time zones up. Englishization, the hottest new take on imperialism. (laughs) I wouldn't be surprised if this provoked a Japanization like these motherfuckers try to take Hawaii back again (laughs) Big Hero 6 was based on true events let's go to chapter 4 from Japan Inc. to Germany come pick up the pace to start this chapter Clyde should have said we think we could turn Japanese people into Nazis (laughs) literally he's going Asian people love authority dear immigrants It pains me to say this. I'm writing with my pen. Go back to your own country. Actually, that wasn't painful at all. It felt kind of good. If you live in America and you still can't speak English, you need to leave. (laughs) I'm making a bigger point here about people going along with the zeitgeist. In my sauna, there's still a guy two and a half years later wearing a mask. He's Mexican. Like, you could tell he's an immigrant. Going to a new nation and blindly following orders, that's how the Armenian genocide happened. (laughs) And Americas happen when people go to a new land and they don't follow rules. They're so happy to be here, these people with the mask, the immigrant. I get it. They're lost and this government is the only person that's done good for them. Like, (laughs) I don't know, man. We need to give these people the history of redlining and... Every time a new ethnicity comes to America, they get got. The Fed hates Italians as much as they hate brown people. So, this was a pretty dumb chapter. It was on making Japanese more similar to one another. I think they've done a pretty good job at that. (laughs) High potentiality for a racist joke. I just decided to look up the, like, ancient Japanese traditions because Clyde just wants to whitewash the Japanese. I'm trying to learn some shit here. In ancient Japan, life was colorful and interesting if you were a samurai. Otherwise, like as a peasant, you worked on a small plot of land for the shogun, the king, and it was all a feudal system, like all of history and today. This started the age-old tradition of the ninja. The farmers, like of a town, would all pool together their steel, and then whoever was the fittest young man in town... They would dress him up in pajamas, in black sheets in the night. They would meld together the town's steel into a katana, and they would give it to their town's strongest ninja warrior. And then at night, this guy would go wreak havoc on the samurais and the shoguns. He would throw ninja stars and stink bombs at the castle. Bro, that's fucking culture. The Minutemen in America? Hell yeah! It's the same concept. The sneaky ninja could defeat the samurai by locating the chink in his armor. Cancel me, I don't care. (laughs) The USA's nursery stories. McDonald's, McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken and a Pizza Hut. I just bought back nostalgia for somebody. American culture is cooler in the sense that our poorest farmers own guns. And so, you know, the Japanese and their... Lowland, they all have their katanas and shurikens. <laughs> the bottom of their class system were peasants below merchants, below everybody, of course. And it, like, mirrored the Greek auxiliary system. So your farm had more honor if your son went to war for the state. And so this is how they started that whole homunculi system. <laughs> Marriages were prearranged in Japan, so it was used as a political tool mostly. 
You could jump over the broom with the person you liked in your small town. We're talking about class here. Pretty interesting here, more interesting than marriage. Falling in love was considered taboo in ancient Japan. It was only allowed in plays. Love is distracting you from what life is really about. Get back to work. Love? That's all extraneous. Japan had the original Romeo and Juliet. It was one of their Shinzu ec epidemics started. The emperor had to outlaw suicide. <laughs> Bro, we are living through a Shinju epidemic. Suicide is illegal. This is why that thing called Sopoku was so brave. It was an honor to tolerate pain. So killing yourself is the ultimate pain tolerance. And when you jumped on the sword, if you winced, you were a pussy. Bro, this culture is awesome. And so, yeah, you chose your, like, best friend to hold the sword for you. So, you, you know what I'm saying here? Copycat killings have been a thing since the dawn of time. There was Romeo and Juliet in Japan, and then everybody started killing themselves. <laughs> I think it's the fear porn U.S. media that is always perpetrating. <laughs> I don't know, man. That's too political. Did you know after World War One? men couldn't pull the trigger on their what their rifles like they did psychological studies and made it so that hollywood films showed excess violence so that people would shoot each other i'm going back and forth here if you watch the rittenhouse trial they tried to get him with circumstantial evidence you played call of duty every single day of your trial he's like yeah it's a fucking video game <laughs> you can't it's correlation but it's not causation Another creepy thing that these feudal landowners did was buy out the local brothels. And so they could target families on the edge and recruit their daughters to work in the brothel. Disgusting, man. <laughs> Modern day only fans. I suspect this is what the Catholic Church did with confession. Like people who study this more have said the priests would have to tell the mayor what everybody's worst secrets were. It's a blackmail organization like Dutro or Epstein. Buddhists, they didn't need a confession box in Japan. They had brothels, so they could just collect dirt on you what your kink was there. Like, <laughs> where would you rather live? Since the love marriages were taboo, men would fall in love with their prostitutes. And yeah, people were getting all kinds of venereal diseases. And that's pretty interesting. Like, every single marriage was about money nevada today they have finally legalized the oldest profession fucking you could get a street walker there when you're an emperor that tries to outlaw love <laughs> it always ends in dead hookers or mass suicide and denver is known for human trafficking because we don't have that legalized it's gotten safer in las vegas since they legalized it same thing happened in japan History repeats. I'm saying if we want to stop dead toots from going to waste, we got to <laughs> make the black market more safe. We'll end the chapter on the Burakumin. This is the poorest class in history that I've ever read about. There was nobody above five, five feet tall. They all had stunted growth. The only thing they could eat was rice and infanticide was common. It's the only source for fresh meat. <laughs> so now that's killing two fetuses with one stone. You ever see that movie, The Platform? That's the past, present, and future of society. It's a pretty good allegory. Uh, everyone referred to the Budakumin as Ida, and that tr directly translates to abundance of filth in America. So it's their hobo class. And it's obviously much worse of a hobo class. Churches are feeding people. Even the temples wouldn't even, wouldn't feed the Budakumin. In 1870, they had an official end to the caste system in Japan. Before that, they were considered one-seventh of a person. What? Black people, quit your jabbering. The three-fifths compromise? <laughs> 
slavery is better than modern homelessness. <laughs> One seventh of a person. That's how we look at the scum on the streets. It's fairly relevant to today. <laughs> You know, 1635 to 1850, a lower level of shogun. He put the entire country under house arrest. It's pretty wild stories of history. Love lockdown. Chapter 5, up with people, down with bureaucrats. Clyde throwing us a bone this one. Trying to gain some trust back before the final call to action chapter. I'm out here saying, fuck all the shoguns. He's working on the Shogun administration in the 80s. Would you guys rather hear about this fucking bureaucrat pushing fake populism? Or how about the history of sex in the Eastern world? Yes, sir. People would travel from all over the world. Marco Polo didn't go there to make a map. He wanted to fuck some dainty prostitutes. Bro, if you go online on some of the deep boards... Everybody's talking about going to Thailand to hook up with ladyboys. <laughs> the Kama Sutra is the biggest thing over there. Those people love sex. Um, they had harems over there in the golden age of sexual liberalization. Fucking today <laughs> is the golden age. We have Pornhub and X videos. Kids get addicted to hardcore porn before their first kiss. The geishas, these are the ultimate sluts of history. They were girls that painted themselves entirely white. Mmm, that yeah, white pussy. For you Zoomers, Geisha is not Genshin Impact Hentai. These are actual 3D women. Spirituality and sexuality were intertwined with the Geishas for all of time. We fuck computers now. 2050 Tokyo. <laughs> I don't know, man. I would fall for Scarlett Johansson if she was the voice of Siri. It's the movie Her reference for people who get it. What I want to get into this is the history. Bro, in China, it was expected that you would have concubines. Yes, I'm going back. My concubines. <laughs> if you live in France or Italy, you would have a gumare or you were a square. You know, this is the history of humanity. Why are people killing themselves? We can't fuck 750 BC, Japan's term for sex was clouds and rain. And so they were saying, when we make love, the clouds connect to the earth with rain. Is this an euphemism for cum? You see how much, um, <laughs> like, more connected or spiritually entwined sex was to them? Opposed to beating off the gape porn. Mmm, society. I think they've, like, wedged uh, materialism between us and sex. It's sounding a little too hippie. Sexuality is about harmony. It's about being part of something greater than yourself. <laughs> and how does that compare to thirst drap Instagram pages where it's all about your ass rather than connecting with a whole? <laughs> Yin and yang, baby. These people talked a lot about essence. It exists in all Asian sexualities. You could go to a gas station and buy <laughs> rhino horn essence. It's the same thing with semen retention they do over there. They thought in history, if you held your nut in, it could make you see through walls. So wouldn't that make it harder because then you would see girls changing? If you held your nut in, they thought it could make you fly. <laughs> The Kama Sutra was the Eastern Empires telling people how to make love. So, bro, think about that. Just, we need to reframe it. The government was giving people a book on how to fuck. <laughs> Our intelligences, this is on WikiLeaks, fund Mind Geek. That's you porn and porn, all of those garbage websites. So, in history, they gave them a book on how to fuck. And now this is the new tribute to the masses i think they call it it's how they keep us docile everybody's wanking the taoist philosophy said if you can have sex with 40 women you soak up their yin <laughs> but you're not allowed to release any of your yang oh babe i'm about to yang you become even more powerful power when you can fuck girls and you don't come that's the whole thing between 
tantric sex. I got to start trying this. I could fly. <laughs> Eastern ideologies are the ultimate tease. Like America, we're going for fucking glory at the end of our sex. <laughs> Babe, I'm almost enlightened. What do you mean? Oh, keep meditating. I'm almost fucking in nirvana. <laughs> They're edging themselves forever. You just have to keep recycling your soul until you reach it. I want to make it to heaven. This is a pretty Chad culture. I'm not going to lie. Concubines. Fucking listen to this ditty. Women, you might want to turn the show off. They said, ladies are unable to ascend. <laughs> you guys can't make it to Nirvana. Yeah. Your yoga teacher probably leaves that part out. <laughs> They did say that uh, women had uh, the ability to gain power by having more children. <laughs> Bro, this is the best lore ever. It's like a comic book. The fucking little old lady who lived in a shoe. She's the most powerful. <laughs> Wasn't that nursery rhyme about her having 20 kids? It's funny. The term red light district also comes from Chinese bordellos. It's a book about Japan. Shut up. They would light up the entire avenue of uh, brothels with red lanterns. So it should be called a red lantern district. The end of the chapter, the Tokugaru period, was the 1600s of Japan. A lot of people call it the height. This was right before Russia came around and made them their bitch brothels were attached to the central plaza and so if wives and kids were like taken proper carefully it was a happy family it was expected that the husband would go to the brothel while they were shopping sick sunday church your dad is hanging out with the nuns in the back <laughs> the geishas made the presence known in their market like it wasn't a jealousy thing they didn't intertwine sex with ego if white people can't wear kimonos, why should geishas be allowed to do white face? <laughs> that's a good point. I want to cut the laugh off because that's a real thinker. That's a hit you on the way homer. That's white face. You're being a racist against my people. <laughs> Let me wear a kimono. You're not ready for this word, ladies and gentlemen. Kabuki. <laughs> kabuki was the name of the theater where men would play women. And, you know, Shakespeare was a copycat. A lot of his Hamlet-esque roles come from the Kabuki shoguns killing princesses. The Montague and the Capulets were actually the Honda and the Toyotas. Kabuki, Kabuki, the girl that's hard to get. Kabuki, Kabuki, the girl who wants my leg. Shapoopy, anyone? The elites, the shoguns, they had fetishes for young boys. <laughs> so they were made the actors and they would bang all the kids. Every empire fucks kids. <laughs> Wild story I read. One of the Japanese emperors, he bought a parrot into the bedroom. And so he would have dozens of different types of girls. And then he had his parrot make a sexual moan. <laughs> so this guy, he made the first MP3 track of chicks having sex. And he would just listen to his parrot and masturbate to the sounds of women banging. What? I need to take the time machine to the Tokugaru period. <laughs> One more uh, tip. If you have a friend who owns a parrot, every time you go over his house, whisper it the N-word a hundred times. <laughs> Somebody must have done that joke. <laughs> Let's go to chapter six, the final one. Why Japan matters. Why does any of this matter? <laughs> to us... The truth will come out at the end. Revelations, Clyde Prestowitz says, In the United States alone, Japanese investments come to more than $300 billion and directly support 700,000 jobs. Like, if we didn't outsource in the first place, this wouldn't be an issue. Thanks, boomers. <laughs> so now we're intertwined with Japan. And if we stop supporting them, a million people in America will lose their jobs. So should we keep propping up the House of Cards or start over? It's the whole World Economic Forum wet dream. The global economy means more power. This is so dumb. I'm try to give them some more 
airtime this last chapter. <laughs> the surface level stuff is boiling, Clyde says. In short, Japan has been the source of some of the most fundamental concepts and processes underpinning the modern world and economy. These have been copied by the most advanced countries like the United States and Germany as well as the Asian Tigers and China's Emerging Dragon. So in Clyde's brain, <laughs> the reason that Korea is so technologically advanced is because they're watching Japan. And the reason that China is so smart is because of Japan. Remember we read uh, the Moai book? The Rapa Nui people, they were on Easter Island. Once they didn't want to buy our beans anymore, we genocided them. And by that I mean Captain Cook and the English people. We. So when Japan stops buying our coffee beans... We're going to stop playing with them. And then China's just going to go over and take it all over. Japan is going to be nuke-free as long as they keep drinking Starbucks is my thought on the whole matter. How did they fucking bounce back after the nuke? <laughs> right? Uh, this is a much bigger issue than fucking caring about fucking predictive models. It takes guts and ego to conduct that big of a human experiment. Truman... <laughs> That ego is one for the record books. In the official story, the city of Hiroshima was warned of a conventional bombing to come. We didn't tell them it was a nuke, but the people were told, get out of the city, we're going to light this place up. And on second thought, <laughs> being instantaneously vaporized might be the most humane way to die. So I guess they did make their decision. The bomb blast was so big that it had two shock waves. The pilots couldn't believe that it was real. The shock wave spread 15 miles in one minute. It de they detonated it 1,000 feet in the air. You know, this maximizes the fireball. There was a mile-high explosion, like the fire went as high as a mile. We unleashed a fucking mini sun on Japan. What, you guys can't handle it? I thought you were the land of the rising sun. <laughs> Gotti. That's a 40,000 foot dust pyre. And they were apparently set into a nuclear summer. Nagasaki. It was a little bit off target, the bombing. It still worked because that one was made with plutonium. And then Hiroshima was made with uranium. You guys ever seen that professor online? This guy eats uranium. I'll probably get censored for saying that. The generals still wanted to fight, but Emperor Hero called it quits. And of course, the people didn't want to fight. We take our orders from generals. Next, it would have been a potassium bomb, said Truman. And that would have rained down banana peels. That's a silly joke. But really, he wanted to drop a potassium bomb. <laughs> Dude, the logistics would have been a nightmare. You know, tanks would have been peeling out. <laughs> yeah, dude, the excuse for no radiation is still unexplained. <laughs> Actually, I, one I've heard was, Well, they detonated the nukes too high. And that's why there's no radiation. <laughs> what? The U.S. generals who rode up on Hiroshima, they were saying that they couldn't get out of the car because of the flies. Philip Morrison said it looked like a giant smashed apart Mitsubishi factory. Guy's a poet, just like his son. I'll bring us full circle. In 20 years, Mitsubishi's going to be supersonic. You know, like, uh, of course, there were some... Japanese X-Men that came up after the bombing, and I'm not dying that 140,000 people in Hiroshima stayed in their house when they were warned that there were bombs about to come. I don't know if it was nuclear. Looking forward, <laughs> ending the book with Clyde Prestowitz. You can't harp on history forever. Big fat one. The interests of the United States and Japan are no longer completely congruent. It is not in America's interest to be drawn into a confrontation that could lead to war with China over who owns what is the East China or South China Seas or anywhere else for that matter. The continued ambiguity of Japan 
makes it increasingly difficult for Washington to rationalize the old security arrangements. What? He just went clear. This guy just told us his true plan and the reasoning in his last pages. He was going, bro, just listen back if you need to. Washington needs to rationalize new security arrangements because Japan is too ambiguous. That's why we're in Iran. That's why we're in Venezuela. We're not in J with Japan because we're friends with them. We're with Japan because they want to be a isolist nation. Like uh, Teddy Roosevelt, the 1920 period of biggest economic growth, he said we should be like closed off Japan. That's how we're going to grow the most. And that's why a million Americans didn't die in World War One. And that's what that quote means. Would you like to see a world of harmonious independent nations or one massive super government? The choice is yours. Well, actually, it's the globalists. <laughs> there it is, ladies and gentlemen. Japan Restored by Clyde Prestowitz. What a fun time it was. Definitely got to learn some history, some new culture. Comment on the video if you hate uh, skewing from the plot like that because sometimes you just can't stomach what these people are trying to brainwash you with. That's going to bring us to our book next week. It's going to give us some real insight. This one is called... <laughs> the Millionaire Next Door. You can find this one on a lot of readers' shelves. We're going to be sussing out all of the get-rich-quick schemes. This author, he got his fortune, and then he wrote the book. That's the opposite of a lot of these types of authors. It's going to be a good change-up from what we've been doing. So thank you guys for tuning in for another edition of Nick's Nonfiction. Please check out Harry Schwunt over on Instagram. It's a fun meme for free every single night. And you are getting your dollars worth on patreon.com slash the niche. Fresh memes first of every month. Amazing cinematic hikes, adventures, comedy podcasts. Our river update should be coming soon. And your top secret books. That was a lot of plugging. Can I get a random soundboard effect to take us home? What a fun episode it was. Thank you, guys. I'll see you all in seven short days. Nick Muniz signing off. Peace.